Hi folks, so in this series of videos or in this course, if you're on, on you know, studying with us, we are kind of moving towards a greater understanding of the technical details of a number of different kinds of security vulnerabilities, including memory vulnerabilities like uh, buffer overflows and understanding stack smashing buffer overflows and how to write your own exploits. Um, and on our way to that journey, we also want to be able to understand how you would go about finding the security problems in the first place. Um, and so that's what we're looking at today. So we're looking at how you go about looking for security bugs. How do you actually go and find out that the buffer overflow was there in the first place? So specifically, we're going to look at um, Fuzz, fuzzing or dynamic um, fuzz testing and um, and we'll also mention um, static analysis and other techniques that you can use. So really before you get to this stage you hope that the people that are designing the software are thinking about the security requirements as they're developing the software and they're doing testing throughout the development process um, but after you finish creating the software uh, and it might be during the, you know, you can use fuzz testing while you are developing software. So you can have an iterative process where you do the bug hunting while you're going. But even if you, after the fact, if you have some software and even if you aren't the developers, with or without the, soft, the source code, there are thing, ways that you can look for security vulnerabilities. And often your goal is either to create an attack um, that proves, you know, for example, you could write a, a um, proof of concept exploit to show that there's a problem in the code, uh, which you could then share with the authors of the software to get them to fix it. Um, and then afterwards, you can use that to like audit the security of systems. Or if you're, you know, if you're an attacker, if you're, if you are, um, you know, on the black hat side of the spectrum, you would just, you know, start attacking computers with the new exploit that you've created. Um, or you can develop a fix to the software. So for example, if it's free and open source software, you might um, you know, fix the software, uh, create a patch that fixes the problem and share it with the, the creators of the software so they can you can fix it for everyone. Or if it's proprietary software, then you can only really do that if you work for the company. Um, so just a reminder, like if you have, if the vulnerability that you um, discover is new, so it's a new problem that other people don't know about, then what you have is a zero day. And that obviously can have sec serious security ramifications. Um, you know, it can lead to the creation of, of worms or um, that spread on the internet through um, vulnerable systems, or it can lead to targeted attacks. Um, and if they um, weaponize the attack and create an exploit, um, that's known as a zero day exploit, uh, if there's no current um, you know, fix or software update that fixes the problem. So, you know, I guess it's a good point when we're talking about how we discover new vulnerabilities to think about what you do with that information. So vulnerability disclosure is about how you tell people about what you find out. So responsible or coordinated disclosure involves first contacting the, the vendors and giving them some time to fix the problem. Uh, before you go public and usually you do that with a given time limit uh, and this is where the the field um, have basically ended up agreeing on which is that well if we give people unlimited amount of time they may never fix the problem so you know we can basically give them a fixed amount of time say 60 or 90 days and say you know in 90 days time we're going public with this information so you know we're giving you enough time to fix the problem and to um, you know uh, get the patches out there but this is a serious problem that we think needs to get addressed and people need to know about it um, so you give them a, a time that gives them time to fix it full disclosure is when you just go public the instant that you find out um, with all the technical details of the vulnerability without giving the vendor a, a, a proper opportunity to fix it so the proponents of this idea say that you need to do this because otherwise they never, the problems never get fixed and, and you know people need to know that they have vulnerable systems. Um, <clears throat> and those are valid points, but the um, you know a lot of people would argue that it is um, 
you know, it's not morally right to, or it's not really responsible to not um, give them a chance to fix the problem because it, you know, could end up causing a huge amount of problem if you're, if these are like serious security problems with software that lots of people are using. So, you know, you should follow your res responsible and coordinated disclosure. Um, if you study with us, we've got our own responsible disclosure policy. So, you know, if you're um, one of our students and you find a new security vulnerability, you should come and talk to me or talk to us about it and we'll um, kind of help to walk you through the process of, of disclosing the vulnerability. So, the, um, so if you have access to the source code, then obviously things that you can do to look for bugs include looking at the actual source code. So you can do a manual code review. So you read through the source code and look for problems. Um, if you use your human, your, your frail human mind to look for the bugs, you will miss things, um, which is why we have bugs in the first place. So you can use automated tools, you can use static analysis, and that's actually software tools will automatically analyze your code to look for problems. Um, and regardless of whether you do or don't have access to the source code, what you can also do is dynamic analysis. Um, well, you could do reverse engineering, which can include st static analysis where you don't have the source code. Um, and <clears throat> there's a whole series of, um, you know, we've covered that previously in, on reverse engineering. And um, there's binary um, static analysis where, um, you know, you can do static analysis on uh, where you don't have the source code and, you know, you can reverse engineer uh, or decompile and di disassemble the um, executables that you have to try and extract source code from that. And you can do static analysis on that. Or you can do um, dynamic analysis which is where you actually run the software and try and look for problems that way. And um, fuzzing or fuzz testing is where we actually do dynamic analysis, where we start the program and we start feeding in um, randomized input, essentially, into the software to try and find bugs that way. Um, because a, a lot of the time, the way that security problems are discovered is when the user is doing something that the author didn't expect. And one example of that is that a bunch of Linux systems have a um, security vulnerability where if you um, bring up a, a virtual keyboard and type on the virtual keyboard and the physical keyboard at the same time fast enough, it causes um, the, locks, uh, the login screen to crash or a lock screen of a, of a, of a screen saver to crash. It's actually a huge security vulnerability and it was discovered by a bunch of kids that were, um, you know, using a computer um, and they were all just mashing away at it and it crashed. And um, thankfully the per there was a um, person that knew enough to realize that it was a big deal and figure out how um, you know, to reproduce it and got their kids again. Couldn't reproduce it himself because he couldn't touch it all fast enough and he got his kids on it again and crashed it again. And so you know, it really helps to create these kind of random inputs into the software that the author does not expect because that's often where things go wrong. So yeah, static analysis can sort of aid code reviews and automatically analyzes code to detect like programming mistakes. And it can detect things that are like easy to detect like um, buffer overflows, memory errors and uns unsafe functions. Again, if you've got source code, <clears throat> some tools will have a high false positive rate or, um, or even and false negative rates as well. So they're not perfect. They won't detect everything, but it's a starting point, you know, it's, better than not having it. So fuzzing um, or fuzz testing is where we basically feed in variations of unexpected input into a program to, um, to try and uncover unexpected behavior. So if what the program is expecting is uh, um, a word, we might try a word. The fuzzer will basically automate the, the um, you know, creating slightly larger words really, really big. What happens when you've got a massive string and you put that into it? Um, what, um, you know, what if we use special characters? What if we, you know, do, do all kinds of like different inputs that wouldn't be expected? Uh, and that can help you find vulnerabilities. And a lot of new vulnerabilities are discovered this way. Um, yeah, a lot are. 
Um, and so they can be used by security researchers to find new security vulnerabilities in software. And you can use it for black box testing um, or white or even gray box testing. So you don't need access to the source code. If you do have access to the source code, to the source code it can be easier to fuzz it better to do it to create a fuzzing script that is actually testing everything. Um, because if you don't have access to the source code or you don't spend some time trying to figure out what it's expecting, you can kind of miss functionality to test. So what kinds of data are worth testing? Um, and what do you trust is valid that you don't bother testing? Basically, you want to test everything that's external to the source code. So especially if it crosses some kind of trust boundary. So if you've got input that's coming from a, an untrusted user, um, then obviously that's the highest value thing to fuzz for. Whereas if it's if the thing that you're the input is controlled by um, an system administrator, for example, then obviously someone would need to be a system administrator in the first place to create the, the, the input that would crash the software. And if the result of crashing the software is that you become the system administrator, that's not as much of a valued target, I guess. So when it crosses a trust boundary, we've got input coming from an untrusted source, like a lower privileged source, like a user, and like a, uh, and then the software is running as a higher privilege. That's that's a you know really you want to test that well. <clears throat> so things that you can fuzz include network protocols. Um, and service requests. So everything that's happening over a network, that's obviously um, worth worth fuzzing. So you can fuzz um, like file formats. So if there's a file that gets sent, that might be sent as a physical file on the machine that then gets read by the program. You can fuzz the file um, that way. Or you can fuzz sending a file over a network. So you can fuzz the format of the file that's being sent. You can fuzz the um, uh, yeah the protocols, so the actual communications that are happening over a network, and the way that they interact with each other. What happens if that's not quite what's expected? Um, you know, what if the tags don't match the content and things like that? Um, when there's API calls, any environment variables that get um, that that are actually consumed by a program. And in fact, normally what happens um, is when a program starts it has access to all those environment variables and they actually get loaded into the the uh, to the area of memory of that program so you know that can actually affect um, software especially if the software then you know reads and uses those environment variables um, if the user is in control of the environment variables um, then that's something you could fuzz 